Let's do an Auslan applause for our co next conversation. Does everyone know how to do that? Good, beautiful, let's do that. Auslan applause for the next conversation. Beautiful. Do I clap myself? <laughs> Hello, thank you very much, Tracy. My pleasure, Fanella. Back, back to the galley. Get back with you. Okay, talking about um, <laughs> beginning. Uh, so we were practicing this during the break, so we're all going to do the dance for you with a hand. So you ready? Women? No. You go in front and <laughs> yeah. we'll follow. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were going to do this, come on. Wait. Okay. I thought we were going to sing. We, we <laughs> could sing. No, I thought the dance would be more fun because it's kind of harder to do. I was a total... Who was really good at that? The cur doing the curry? Okay. I was terrible. Um, okay, so we're talking about arts and health here, of course, making the connections as we make connections today. Um, and from John Coveney to, to four amazing women who work across different spectrums in the field. So um, I won't go into great detail about who they are and what they do because that will come out through the course of our conversation. But um, briefly, Sally Francis uh, is an arts coordinator, arts and health at the Flinders Medical Centre. So interested in arts management and acute health care. Round of applause for Sally Francis, please. You can get more enthusiastic as we go along, okay? Oh, um, <laughs> well, no, I just want it to be big, like for the next person, Christine Putland, who is a community cultural development practice, social health and wellbeing, art to promote wellness and research. Uh, uh, yes, Christine, welcome to you too. Um, a consultant specialising in research. <laughs> Christine's got a very long and fabulous bio, so do read through that. It's That's longer than mine. <laughs> uh, uh, also joining us uh, is an architect and design uh, aficionado, um, Associate Professor Jan Jane Lawrence is the Associate Head of School Teaching and Learning in Architecture, Art and Design at the University of South Australia. Welcome to you. <laughs> and uh, Paula, surname, awesome name, Paula Gillespie Fotheringham is the Program Coordinator on the Graduate Program of Counselling and Psychotherapy at the University of Adelaide. Hello Paula. Big round of applause for everybody. Um, again, we're going to be asking questions uh, during this uh, next hour or so. But if you have a really, I've got to say, if you have a really burning question um, for any of our panel members during our, our first part of the conversation, please put your hand up because it might be that might be the perfect moment to go to your question. Then, so let, let's do that. Um, so we're talking about arts and health, and I kind of just wanted to get to start with sort of some broad brushstrokes from each of you about what that actually means. So, because it is a bit of a challenge to define. I know John um, gave us his interpretation of it. It's quite broad. So let, let's, let's kick off. I'm going to put you in the deep end there, Jane. Broad brushstrokes. Before we talk about what you do specifically, what do you think art and health is about? Well, I actually think it's, oh, is that working? Oh, it's a bit um, low. That's okay. But, uh, uh, from my, I should say from my perspective, it's actually about the sense of and personalisation in terms of art, particularly in the health communities, and it, it doesn't matter whether... Can you hear me? We just... Uh, it's okay. I'm, well, you know what, we're going to go to Paula while we just bring up Jane's microphone just a bit closer to the top. Uh, Paula, broad definition of art and health? Okay, so for me, I think it's an opportunity to recalibrate, to re have some space to recalibrate our brains back into creativity, so I think we spend so much time in our very cognitive state and that it's a chance to kind of dive back into that creative self. And I don't know, I'm a little bit torn with this idea of arts and health because it's more, that's just more arts in general. So I'm a little bit reluctant to pull it into that health setting. So. Okay, all right, we'll unpack that a bit more. Yeah. Um, Sally? Um, well, Sorry. I think um, arts and health is incorporation or the use of arts um, in healthcare. Um, in a healthcare environment and also, you know, in, in a community for health and well-being. Christine? Okay, um, I think very broadly because, as I may get a chance to say, my, my perspective is broad because as I've worked with many of you in this room, in fact, you, that's the breadth of it. So I see arts and health as a field of practice. Um, I call it a field, not a sector. I see it as a field of practice which... Um, Again, I can talk about this, but it basically has, it tends to be regarded as having five domains of, of parts of the field of practice. And it's basically practicing art with health and well-being in some form or another in mind. So it's, um, it's not saying that 
all arts practice ought to be oriented towards health and wellbeing outcomes, but arts and health for it to be a meaningful field as distinct from art in general um, needs to be defined as having health and wellbeing deliberately in mind in some form or another, and of course that's very broad. Okay. I like broad churches to start with. I think that's good. Uh, sorry about that. Hello, Jane. What do you reckon? <laughs> I actually agree, and I think that... Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, good. Um, that was interesting, Christine, because, you know, you could also look at art practices as um, the practice in its own right as um, uh, about well-being and yeah. health um, as either an artist or those who might be actually engaging with that practice. And how does it manifest for you in, in your industry, art, architecture, design? It's, it's a different type of industry perhaps than specifically working in occupational therapy or something that other people are doing. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm a, little, I'm a little bit of a fraud here, you know, because I'm... Well, I'm get off the stage. The <laughs> I just can't take this anymore. I'm coming from a design <laughs> perspective and, um, and I've got several examples of, of, um, uh, of art in um, architecture and design and... For me, one of the most poignant um, stories I can tell you is, and some of you might be familiar, that it's an aged care um, hostel in the southern part of this state that was built maybe about 10 or 15 years ago. And the architects involved in that had commissioned an artist to do a trompe l'oeil painting, which is kind of a realist painting on a wall. And it was the typical scene that you might see in an aged care environment. It was a it was a cottage with a beautiful kind of English garden with hollyhocks and roses and a little picket fence and a gate and a cat walking along the edge of the, of the fence. And there was a resident every morning that would put out a bowl of a saucer of milk for the cat. And for me, that was really about that engagement with art in a completely different way. So it is about, you know, the therapeutic, it is about the health and the wellbeing, and it's also a sense of ownership um, of that artwork and be able to be engaged in it in a, in a slightly different way. Mm. Uh, but for you also, it's about sense of place. So it it's is. about how that space is designed, how we move through, navigate and circulate through. Yeah, and so, you know, art could be used as a way of, uh, of a means of wayfinding through, um, you know, buildings, for example. Mm. And it's also about viewing, you know, that quite often, and I see it all the time, that irritates me, that, you know, artwork is put in a place where you can't actually view it. You know, you're walking past it and you're not engaging with it so that there isn't... And I'm not talking about a gallery setting where you have a perfectly poised bench in front of a piece of artwork, but the means in which you actually design space and art together so that you really can have that meaningful engagement. OK. Um, and Sally, that's interesting, maybe to follow on from that, because I know at the Flinders Medical Centre that's something that you're very specifically involved with in terms of curating. But what, what about for you... The, 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 sort of the definition of art we've already, and health we've already kind of covered, but how does it manifest quite clearly in, in your role at um, Flinders Medical Centre? Mm. Actually, just before I comment on that, is um, just a sense of ownership and art incorporation design um, in terms of ownership that we have at Flinders Medical Centre um, quite a lot of um, environmental art um, in terms of our new developments and we've done a lot of research and consultation on that work um, but in the emergency department the staff decided they actually wanted to have their own photos there so we had a photo competition and there were 260 staff put photos in and they were displayed and there was a people's choice and then from those we chose the best in terms of high resolution, etc., um, to put on large scale panels in the emergency department. And people love those works because the staff took the photos and staff take friends and show them, and, and they're all mostly local photos. So it is a real sense of ownership. And, and then a step beyond that is in the mental health short stay unit. We can't have those panels there because of the issues around security, them being levered off the wall and used as sort of projectile, um, you know, sort of objects and things. So we're actually using this picker wall system which are sticky-backed acrylic photographs on the wall. And, um, and one of the staff said, oh, well, that's great because we can move them around. And you just think, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> and, and so, and on the mental health unit, they are actually, they've got these, you know, sticky photographs that they're sort of moving around and taking down. And it's sort of like, well, 
gosh, uh, that's not really art as part of our acquisitioned art collection, you know. So it's sort of like it brings out that whole thing, I suppose, you know, what is art and, you know, where does it, where does it stop? I mean, but they make a difference and they have a huge impact. And for the patients and for the staff, they have a huge, you know, huge benefit. So I think um, a lot um, in terms of the work we do in the hospital, a lot of what we do is around, it's around, um, it's around ownership, but it's also around control. So um, in an acute care setting, you know, people are pretty sick when they're brought in um, and you just you relinquish a lot of control and and by way you almost have to you know I mean and I know from being a patient you want to let go you just tell me you know what I'm having done and you know um, with obviously some decision making in there but I think a lot of the especially in a participatory sense um, you know actually offering somebody um, uh, you know an avenue to express themselves or to be distracted or whatever is really valuable in that person taking control of a very small part of their environment environment um, and whether that's deciding what they're going to paint or actually saying no I don't want to participate there's very few things in a hospital you can say no to you know you can't someone comes to take blood and you can't say no thank you not today mm. um, so it's a great I mean it always sounds really sort of a bit um, you know futile to say that but it is another element of it so, so you're I, talking about agency so the the, the, the patient mm. themselves can actually make their own choices and that where art yes. allow, allows it to happen yes mm. for sure and when they do participate it then is actually an issue around identity what they choose choose to do, how they choose to share it. It becomes, um, you know, part of their, their space, I suppose, and they can share that with their visitors or with the staff. Um, and then, then it, it has, then I said, I guess, embodies another meaning. Mm, yeah. mm. Does that, how does that feed into the work that you do, Paula? It, it's a little bit different, but it has the similar similarities. Absolutely. Um, I was nod nodding vigorously as I was talking. I love, so, a, no I love <laughs> a nod vigorously. I go, great, you're next. Okay, great. <laughs> you're the cue. Getcha. You're on. Um, yeah, okay. So um, in one of my roles, um, I managed a therapy department at a psychiatric hospital. And um, I was also an art therapist um, within that role too. And so the clients that would stay at that hospital... Uh, uh, it was so important for them to have some sense of control over any aspect of life that they could have some control over. And obviously, it's, it was more beneficial if that could be in, a, in a, a, a way that was safe for them and creativity and definitely fell, uh, fell into that area. And so we ran various different art programs at the hospital and we ran recreational arts groups and groups that were around um, building social networks. But we also um, facilitated one-to-one -one art therapy sessions. And so it's really making me think about this uh, interplay and difference between the two different areas, but how they do fit together. And so the arts groups would create art for the hospital and that that would be through genuine participation, not tokenistic participation, so where uh, clients would have the opportunity to, to decide on the project from the start and have ownership of it through the entirety of that. And then really we would be thinking about some things to do with safety. Um, but it, yeah, and uh, the, also that then having access to art therapy in that setting. So mm. there's lots of similar themes that are coming to mind. Yeah. Okay, uh, and Christine, community and cultural development. Uh, community arts and cultural yeah, development. Yeah, community arts and cultural <laughs> I know, there's so many, okay. um, so many acronyms. Community arts and cultural development, uh, how does yeah. it play in, in your field? Okay, can I just, can I contextualise the answer by saying, um, aside from the fact that saying that I'm a researcher and so I quite like to categorise things because, you know, it's bringing some kind of structure. The field, as I mentioned, tends to be, internationally, tends to be regarded as falling into... Um, five broad domains and there's a lot of overlap and the practice o is overlapping and I'm not for a moment saying, you know, they're separate. And you have, in fact, um, representation here from, um, you know, health programs <coughs> in health settings that Sally is, is talking mainly about. We have um, therapy-oriented uh, practice. Um, w what we don't have is the discussion about arts and humanities in professional education, which is another part professional, health professional education, which is another big part of the field. Mm. Um, and the, the one that we, um, we is that you mentioned is the community arts and cultural development. 
and a way of seeing where they fit together. And John Coveney actually talked about this from a health perspective. And I think if we are trying to talk across those audiences, it is quite useful to sort of think in terms of how the health sector, if you like, sees the world, whether it's healthist or whatever. Um, if you think about it in terms of upstream and downstream determinants of health, so the things that determine the things in our lives and our world that, that we organise that determine health and wellbeing from the health population, i.e. the upstream, before people um, uh, can be categorised as having, you know, being in risk groups or, and also before they have particular health problems that can be identified and an arts program might relate to particular health issues. Community arts and cultural development, I'm getting to it, broadly <laughs> is mainly found in that upstream broad area where it, you see um, artists, producers, arts workers, um, professional uh, experienced in working with communities are working with people who would not regard themselves necessarily as artists, um, but like someone like mm. John, for instance, who may still be um, creating and engaging in various ways with the, um, with the sort of um, expertise, if you like, of an artist, a practising artist. Um, and th with, the, uh, with the emphasis being on that, though, that the people who are participating actually have, are, are involved in all of that process. So they're involved in developmentally, in the ideas behind it, in um, uh, realising those ideas, sometimes in performing, presenting, exhibiting. And it is very much in that area of developmental evolutionary practice. Um, and and we, we describe it as being mainly in the sort of community arts kind of area and cultural development, which is you know, the broader sort of category of culture in more generally, where the question of is it art is perhaps less important in a way. Mm. Um, so. That's really interesting. So how does that, I mean, Paula, maybe from your perspective, the question of is it art, uh, you just raised that trying to even get people to even know that this is what's going on is half of the battle, if that makes sense. So, so what, what, are, what are some of the barriers that you come up against, I suppose? Uh, so, uh, so barriers in terms of art, art therapy engagement or um, arts well, can, engagement in general? Well, you've just given me both answers. Let's go for <laughs> both of them. <laughs> okay. So, so maybe I should address the question that I get often, asked quite often. So what's the difference between arts and art therapy? And I would say with art therapy, the difference is about the intention. <clears throat> and you know, when somebody comes to art therapy, they bring a particular life circumstance or issue that they're going to focus on and that's why they're seeking out therapy or that's why they've perhaps been mandated to therapy which is different very different from general arts engagement and recreational arts and community arts so where the intention isn't so specific and of course there's um, therapeutic gain or quite frequently there's therapeutic gain but it's not the focused intention so you know um, I frequently engage in my own arts practice. You know, I spend three hours every Tuesday painting. And for me, that's the chance to you know, renew my spirit, to get emerged in creativity. But I'm not having to think about you know, my relationship with my mother or you know, my relationship with my children. I'm, I'm having... We can do that now. We can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd save that for therapy. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a chance, though, where I get to um, have some break from that and to really get emerged in art making. And so I think that that's the, the profound difference between the two. You know, there is obviously overlap, but I think it's that focus difference. Mm, OK. And, and Sally, for, for you? Um, I suppose, I mean, in the hospital setting, um, there's such a broad range in which we work. Um, so, you know, from sort of um, art as presented as an audience and a view, someone just viewing art through to participatory arts. And I suppose in terms of um, framing the work in the hospital, and it's not so much a barrier, but I guess a condition is the way in which we present 
those different areas to, um, to the areas we're wanting to work in or the artists wanting to work in. So I think we're very clear in the hospital about what is um, art for a therapeutic gain as opposed to art that is therapy. Because within the hospital um, health environment, um, you know, professional practice is very, um, you know, heavily um, sort of... Uh, uh, Augmented. I mean, so, you know, our art therapists are credentialed art therapists. Mm. And they sit within a clinical team and they work towards specific clinical outcomes. That's the pointy um, stuff that, that John yeah, was talking about. Yeah, that's the right. pointy stuff. And it has a whole other set of responsibilities and accountabilities that go with that practice. Um, and, um, and then there is art, which could be a musician coming into play, et cetera, which has huge therapeutic gain. Um, and it just depends. I mean, how we decide, you know, what, what patient or what environment gets what um, depends on how they are presented. We have a patient referral system, and each of those referrals that come in, we then assess and work out what the best, um, you know, um, whether it's participatory or, or whatever. I mean, it could be someone at end-of-life care. So I guess it, it's, we have to be really cautious um, about how we present what we're doing and, um, and make sure that we are actually being, you know, professional and accountable. Mm -hmm. Jane, what, what are some of your thoughts listening to, listening to the conversation so far? I just want to bring this back to a micro level and um, <coughs> perhaps input to the panel too. Um, about, and again, it's about the personalisation of space. I had a, um, a student who was on the transplant plant waiting list and she was in and out of hospital and she was a young teenager and kept this journal and was formed part of her um, honours thesis. And, and one of her arguments was about personalisation of her own space because she wasn't always getting the same bed in the same ward and the ward was often shared with very elderly people. And she was a teenager. But there was nowhere in her little enclave where she could put her artwork, photographs. There wasn't the space. There wasn't any area on the wall to hang that so that she her engagement with her art practice or her things that were meaningful to her in her life, and it doesn't always have to be a painting, it can be any object um, that's art, didn't have a place. And so, you know, and I see that in a lot of the aged care environments as well that I work mm. in, and, you know, we shift mum and dad, you know, from the big family home into aged care and a small shoebox. Um, very little space, again, for the personalisation. All of the objects that they bring from their lives into another setting doesn't have a place. And so I guess from a design perspective, you know, um, and it's not a criticism, it's just something that I think that we really need to think about is how do you personalise your own space and what opportunities in the design mm. is there for that? But that gets... Sorry, it's yeah, Christine. Mm. I, I think it's interesting because there, there are many, many <laughs> things that we sort of need to be saying. Um, and I think that one of the things that I perhaps didn't emphasise in terms of the community arts and cultural development um, uh, part of the, the, the spectrum, if you like, is the, the tendency to work and the meaning of working in that upstream um, area means that the, the health issues or concerns that you are responding to are often quite different and they're often not about individuals. Uh, they may be and individuals who get involved may, you know, find within that um, a, a response that they can make to it. But it, it is very often about those broad um, uh, conditions, if you like, around uh, issues like social uh, connectedness or isolation um, engagement with what's happening around them and a sense of control, you know, which you've, you've also alluded to, um, a sense of having a role, having a value, having a productive um, a, a part of your life that you can... And, and also it's very often that basic thing of being able to express what's going on in your own lives for people like you and for people who are different from you. Um, and so it is that very generalised sense that we would probably all tend to call well-being, but behind, sitting behind this practice is in the health field, as I'm sure John um, will vouch for me, in terms of public health, there is a huge body of knowledge around the impact that these sorts of factors have on people's ultimate health and, you know, the way they can live their lives healthily, if you like. So. Um, I just thought it was important to sort of say that we, it, 
that while it doesn't often start with the individual in that way, mm. there, it, it has individual impact. So there's a huge body of knowledge, as you say. There's an understanding of the benefits and the successes that can come from this. But we've sort of touched on some of the barriers that allow those connections to happen. Mm. So how do you, how do you, I mean, what, well, maybe we, do we need to talk about more barriers or go straight to the big solutions to make, to make it work? What, what do you think, Sally? Um, I think in terms of the design, I think the, um, <coughs> the involvement of the actual, of the patients mm. um, and the staff in, in healthcare design is absolutely critical and not just sort of focus groups. I mean, I know, I remember there was one st uh, study where they put a group of children in a white room with different coloured toys to try and work out what colours they should have the ward, you know, and, and <laughs> these primary coloured building blocks and the, the way they ordered them, they then chose the colours for the, I mean, it's just ridiculous. That sounded like it's, a, it, <laughs> like, 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 like the Turner Prize or something in the UK. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. And, and, and obviously goes, you know, it goes into, as, as you know, um, Kay would know, you know, the, the colours, the textures, the shapes of a space that influence the way in which you feel. Um, I suppose at a, at a micro level at, at FMC we supply end of life um, patients with the with nurture packs with boxes which have things that they can put around the room. I mean, it's for the patient. It's as much for the family though, the carers. Um, there's n a knitted nana blanket and a little LED candle and lavender and all these sort of sensory things. A journal to write your thoughts, things that you might not be able to say but you can write down. And it's about that thing again of control, changing the environment in a space where you feel um, you. You know, you've lost your independence, and mm. you, you'd obviously rather be at home. But and the feedback is that it, it completely changes that family's experience of that death, of that death of a relative. I mean, not just in that space. They take the things home with them in the box, and they reflect on them. And it, you know, I think it goes a long way to them actually coming to terms with with that process. So. Mm. Um, Paula, this, this it's some kind of feeds into what you do as well, because it's about finding creative interventions for your, your patients or the people that you work with. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, picking up on that theme that Jane introduced about personalisation, I mean, that's something that is obvious in practice time and time again. You know, if I go into work in a school, it's quite possible that I'm allocated a different room, a different time slot. Um, you know, the child might be brought out of gym or assembly. And um, there's a real sense of disorientation and not feeling safe in the space. So I really endeavour to, to have a... Um, a portable way of having a same and consistent space. So, you know, I might have a tablecloth that's always the same one and the room's set up in the same way and I have some of the same objects so that it's personalised into a, a therapeutic safe space for that time period. Mm. Because how can a child work on difficult issues if they're not feeling safe in their environment? And I think that that's a theme that's across all areas. You know, it's about that need for personalisation and safety and the, the well-being that's linked to that. Um, and, and I've just gone I think that's, I was going to say, that's fantastic, because I remember being dragged out of class in front of everybody else to go and do, I can't remember, speech therapy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you just felt like you were, you were the, you know, the pariah in the room. So to try and make that experience... Uh, precise and beautiful is, is wonderful. Back to crying yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> so you were continuing on? To... Yeah, so, uh, so I suppose for me, um, the themes really are around uh, visibility and accessibility. And I think, you know, I'm thinking about art therapy in particular, yeah. but I think that this might be translatable just to, to arts and health in general. Um, you know, I, it's, it's necessary for people to see what we do to be able to understand it and then be able to want to or know how to access it. So for me, those are themes that are really important. Mm. Okay, well, that's a really good point here because we're talking about connections today. So seeing what you do. So how do you connect the dots? How do you gain that visibility? Christine, maybe this is something that you, in your work in community arts and cultural yeah. development, <laughs> I'll get that one right. Yeah. Um, yes, look, at, I think that being able to see the, the effects and hear people talk about the effects is still the most powerful way to actually open people's eyes if they haven't already understood that it might be a possibility. I mean, we've seen examples of that um, at the um, uh, at Flinders Medical Centre, you know, where, where people have actually encount had encounters where they've seen the kinds of responses that people have had to these experiences, and they, they can be so profound. Um, and, 
you know, I mean, I think John was mentioning the fact that it is very difficult in the field that I'm describing, I'm re representing the CACD field. It is really difficult to get the kind of um, numerical, um, we can prove that this is linked to that kind of evidence. Um, but what you can do and what is building increasingly is making the connections to both the, the theories that are, um, in, in a broader sense, um, and at a, at, a, at a bigger level, at a sort of macro level, at population levels, the connections that are being made in research at that level, making those connections to the smaller examples. Um, and, you know, I think, um, uh, again, sort of reflecting one of the things that, that John gave an example about, there's a, um, one of the sort of arguments that's often made is that, you know, why do we have to set out to prove something when we can actually listen to what people are saying and if we find, as John was saying in, in that example he was using, um, in the arts, you know, if, we, if we're finding that the people are describing the same kinds of experiences and effects all around the world, a lot of it isn't even formally published, but the con it's continually coming out. Why do we say, well, that, okay, you said that, but why would we believe that? Why would we not believe it? Mm. I mean, people, why would people say these things they don't know each other from around the world, you know, and if it's happening repeatedly, there's something going on. Yes, so, so but what, what's, what's the end result? What do you need? Who do you need to speak to? Everybody's agreeing, but you need to get some kind of um, resolution. So is that about funding? Is it about getting investment? Well, is it I think about it depends where you want to embed level? it. I actually right. think it depends where you want to embed it. I mean, a really interesting example is one of the country arts programs that was running for three years, Change in Adaptation, which was specifically, it was a three-year program across southern Fleuria and into the Adelaide Hills, working with um, country health agencies um, plus the environment department plus local government um, to embed arts in non-arts organisations practice. And look, I'm not, and I evaluated that, I'm not pretending it wasn't tough. I think I'm staring at Anthony now and I think he would be nodding saying, yes, it was hard work. But at the end, they were all saying, we do get this. Now we need to find space within our budgets and our policy priorities in our own organisations to allow us the flexibility to develop those kinds of programs. We can see it working. And mm. they talked a lot about that in the final evaluations, didn't they, Anthony? And the frustration is that a lot of the flexibility in health at the um, community arts end of things for funding those kinds of programs used to come from the health promotion categories. And unfortunately, in this state, and I'm pretty sure across the country it's, it's tending to happen, because we're in such a dire strait um, in terms of acute healthcare funding, most of the funding from the broader, more flexible um, health promotion categories, which were which people could use discretionary, you know, mm. in a discretionary way, um, is just drying up. There is very little of, of that left. And so... So you have to think more broadly yes. uh, or, or more laterally about how to do yes. that. Sally, what are some of the things that you think need mm. to happen? Paula and Jane, I'd love to hear your mm. thoughts on this too. Um, well, I, um, at FMC, I mean, I do feel incredibly privileged. The program's been running for 20 years there now. And um, just picking up on what Christine said, I think it's, it's been running not because we have just, I mean, we have presented evidence, and it's certainly based on a lot of the evaluation Christine's done and on research, but it is also really heavily based on people seeing over time the difference it makes and having their own personal transformation as well as seeing what it does to other people. So there have been, there've been key people in executive who have seen, have seen the changes it's made and has had an impact on them. So it's, I think you know, it is a challenge for arts and health how you do present both that research and give people the personal experience because I think that certainly at FMC is what has meant um, the program has kept going and has been funded. Um, and we do, um, in the current environment, we certainly struggle um, because of the decrease, the chronic decrease in arts funding, which is absolutely shocking. Um, we are not impacted in our general day-to-day -day running of the program. So in that way, we're, we're really privileged. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Paula, what do you think? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of uh, thoughts that I've had that, that feed into that. Um, 
we've seen the uh, the transformation really through art therapy in terms of, a lot of it's come through students that go into organizations uh, for placements and it could be that a student goes into an organization a school for example that have never had art therapy on site before and that within a very rapid time period they see the benefit that it's having within the organization and not just in schools but you know in community groups and and so that locally has been a way that that's developed definitely and now we have frequent inquiries for you know more students this is awesome um, and also it's making me think a little bit about um, some work that Neil Springham in the UK did where he developed a um, way of recording service user clients experiences of engaging in in art therapy specifically um, however, I think it's a very transferable way of recording that experience. And these were called AIRS, um, audio image recordings. And the process was that the, the client would choose two or three key images that they'd created, and they would speak to um, four or five uh, questions about what therapeutic benefit and what well-being benefit they'd gained from being in, in, engaged in that creative process. And so they would make this short film that was just their images and it would be their voice. And it really took on a life of its own. It was going to be used for, um, uh, for, for gaining funding and, and establishing funding, but it became a tool where clients could show it to their family so they wouldn't have to repeat their story and what had happened in therapy. And it became very owned by them in a different way, and some of the clients decided to put their, their films on, on uh, YouTube and, and share them in a, to a wider community. So it's just making me think of some very practical ways of creating visibility for, um, for arts and health and art therapy. You know, mm. I think there's lots of potential there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wonder, maybe, Jane, from an architect's point of view, <laughs> is, there a, is there a different way that could happen for those who are working with arts and health and you looking at to, towards other fields? Mm. I mean, a big, of course, uh, field at the moment is design thinking, rethinking yeah. how you do things in the first place. Yeah. So I wonder if I could get your perspectives. <clears throat> um, there's a, for me, one of the most beautiful examples of that in architecture is a, is a fairly new building. It's the Royal Melbourne Children's Hospital, and I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that. It was designed by Bates Smart in 2014, I think, and it's won lots and lots of awards. But it's, you know, going from the micro to the macro scale, and for me, it's one of the most joyous medical spaces you could possibly imagine for children. Totally immersive in its design, utterly, you know, um, managing the change of what um, clinical health environments for children should be like. Right from the way in which you enter into this building, which is almost through a playground atmosphere, um, demystifying, I think, a whole lot of medical practices, which we all know for children are, are terrifying. Yeah. But it's not just the children themselves, it's the parents who are fretful, it's their the siblings and the families that also are affected by this. And so these environments are set up for the entire family to engage in, not just for the patient and the parent. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, there's um, great big atrium spaces with um, uh, kind of imaginary aquariums. And um, in, in each of the spaces, it's managed through um, wayfinding by different colours and themes. Um, in artwork that's applied or integrated. There's great walls where children can sit down and draw whiteboards. They're encouraged to draw and, and, and affect the walls. They get wiped clean. It's no big deal. So this is forever an evolving environment. But um, <clears throat> even the staff um, wear bright coloured um, gowns. And it's wonderful. So you go from one ward to another and they're in, you know, bright pink or, you know, bright blue. And so, you know, it's, it's a, I probably wouldn't go so far as to say it's a fun environment for everyone, but it's certainly an environment from um, an architecture and from an arts perspective that I think is ent entirely immersive mm. um, and engaging. And I think that that's, you know, a really important aspect um, for the wellbeing of all of those, those user groups, not just 
and, and the staff as well, not just the patients. Yeah, okay. I think, I mean, the new Royal Adelaide Hospital has been built on the whole area of evidence-based healthcare design and the work of Brian Lawson from Sheffield University was quite critical in that, you know, the, area, the thing of patients, you know, having a view out of the window and being able to control the air conditioning single rooms and so it's great, I think that's, you know, that's being, you know, adopted more and more in Australia, some of those, those theories. Mm. Can I also just say in terms of, um, you know, sort of support and progressing arts in health, um, I think there are, I mean, within health, transforming health, one could think could be, um, you know, a, a really bad time to be trying to, um, you know, to increase activity within arts and health because of it being based on, you know, funding cuts, etc. But I think it's also, it's this thing of, you know, sort of jumping on an opportunity and transforming health has been a huge opportunity, I think, for a lot of arts and health initiatives. It's because everything's being re-evaluated and, you know, restructured and certainly in the South, you know, it's been an opportunity to say, well, you know, this is a, this is an area arts and health can work and here's the evidence etc so I think you know it's just grasping opportunities where you can and this gain traction. and right now we're, <laughs> this is a moment to grasp that opportunity <coughs> particularly mm. with this you know the funding cuts etc mm. it's a way, new ways of thinking about it how to how to connect mm. those dots I love keep, I love saying those sentences connect those <laughs> dots uh, I, we should go to questions but I, I did have one from a question from someone in the audience who said they may be too shy to ask the question so can I start with one before we throw the microphone around um, which was uh, that she was just getting started in she wasn't actually that shy, I'm just saying it. I'm just <laughs> um, was just getting started thinking about doing arts uh, in, in the practice. So how do you even start? If you're, if you're a health practitioner, where do you even begin? Like, what's the best moment to begin? Christine? It depends what part of health you're working in. And I basically would probably start by finding out who's working in that sphere already and going and talking to them and looking at what they do and understanding what's worked and what hasn't worked because that's where the knowledge is. There is, I mean, it is, you know, it is a practice. It is, has grown up as a practice that people are doing because they can see the benefits. There's no, there's no imperative to do this work for most health workers, you know. It, they do it because they can actually see it makes a difference. And... Um, so I think you go and talk to them and mm. basically, so, you know, if I knew what specific area of health, I'm sure we could all make suggestions about yeah, okay. who to talk to But the point that is that the motivation is there, so yeah, you're you on a need winner. To, and you yeah. need to start asking the questions and finding out what, what people have learnt because there's a lot of learning already and that you don't need to start right. by, by making all the mistakes. Of course, okay. you know, <laughs> having said that, Every situation, every context, every group you're working with will, of course, be you know be different because that's what the arts are like, and it's also a bit what health's like. So, yeah. thank you. Just thank you, Tracy. If you could just scoot slow. around there. That was thank a bit you. Slow. Yeah, there she is. It sounds like everybody here already understands that arts and health combined is beneficial. How do we bring this to the decision makers and how do we bring this to the funders so that when artists would like to include it in their practice, they can be funded to do it? Well, <laughs> Sally. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, well, I got a phone call yesterday, actually, from um, a philanthropy organisation in Melbourne who got a, a request for funding around arts and health. So this person rang and said, you know, I don't know about this. Can you tell me? What can you send me? So I think it's just gathering all those, you know, evaluations and, and research documents and, and giving, you know, I talked to her for quite a while, giving examples and, you know, of other programs and what we do, etc. So I think there's plenty out there to gather. I mean, I know, I think research is really important. I think research in Australia is really important. But I think there's, there's so much out there as well internationally, you know, and, and the way someone responds to a heart being played in, in you know, in... Torquay in the UK is going to be pretty similar to here. So I think it's, it's just using all that information that's out there and giving examples. Uh, thank you. A question at the front. Just going on from that. Um, one, one second, please. Wait, wait. Tracy's coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. You're doing a great <laughs> job. <laughs> um, just going on from that. If you came to me as an art person and I want to be directed to find where can I go on the net? to find the information because I think a lot of it is time consuming and unless I'm as a health professional really really interested 
you've got to sell it to me. So is there somewhere that has statistics, research that I can that we could say, okay, <coughs> we can direct you to this and this backs us up mm. to try and get a foot in the door? Well, I have to say, being an ambassador for the Institute for Creative Health, I would mm. say the Institute for Creative Health mm. website, mm. which has got a whole proving um, web you know page on it with huge amounts of information mm. as a start. Okay, you've got to find the right places to tell you where to go to find the right places, okay. which is um, part of the problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. This is it. I read it and I go, wow. Yeah. That's so, it. Okay, so maybe this actually reaches a really good point. You have some websites, but actually as a sector, there needs to be a stronger marketing push to communicate the goals. There's an instant network here, and there'll be a, there'll be a lot of people here who could say, start here, 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 and here, as well as the institute. Mm. <laughs> well, the, this, this place does it well. Okay, there was a question just, just here. Oh, sorry, Jane, whilst the and this is a, going to This is not a plug for UniSA, but we do have an arts and health, um, sorry, art and design and health and wellbeing cluster um, in, um, in our university, and I know that there's some people in here that are part of that cluster. Um, and there's a lot of events, there's um, talks, there's research, um, and um, so if you click on that, It'll take you to that site and you can make those connections that way. Can you repeat that, please? It's Art and Design in Health and Wellbeing. And it's, um, you'll find that on the uni, the University of South Australia website. And that's connecting the hoof and the arts communities within the university. They set up a lot of seminars and events. Um, <coughs> they sponsor um, some research activities. Mm. And engagement and... Uh, and, and, and Paula, in your field, is it easy to find information or should it all be in one big, you know, one big cauldron? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not quite that simple. Um, so the, the main information about art therapy in Australia are through two different organisations. So uh, ACARTA, the Australian Creative Arts Therapy Association, and ANZATA, I'm <laughs> trying to remember what that stands for, but it's a variation on Australia, that. Australia, New Zealand? Um, yes. <laughs> Um, and so there are two main bodies and so evidence based for art therapies can be found on those two websites and I would also suggest that both the American Art Therapy Association and the British Art Therapy Association are really good sources of information and tend to publish and hold um, uh, libraries of research so that um, mm. you know, practitioners can draw on that very easily. But, yeah. but it was the peak bodies for the uh, art therapy associations yeah. in each country, Australia, New Zealand, America and England. So yes. go to those websites. Yeah, definitely. Google search, the power of Google. Mm -hmm. Thank you, your yeah. question was in the middle. Oh, hello. Um, my name's Mandy Brown from Country Arts SA. We've been talking about health and wellbeing, but sometimes um, health naturally fails. And I'm just wondering whether there's consideration within health infrastructures for those salation rooms and grief rooms, um, or transition rooms even, because um, I've seen the Sejuna Hospital where they had, a few years ago, when they built the new hospital and they had a beautiful room for Aboriginal people, but it was only for Aboriginal people, and there was an artist that was commissioned locally, an Aboriginal artist who did a triptych of country, so that people were connected to country when someone passed there in the hospital. And there was also a little healing garden, so they could go out and have a private area. Um, and the Women's and Children's Hospital has not long had a room that's for any faith that you can go in, and it's a private room that I just saw the other day, and I was really amazed by that, because there was nowhere um, when my granddaughter passed away at the Women's and Children's that I could go to. Mm. So I just had to leave and go home. And I just think, you know, this is a very important part of life. And although we talk a lot about health and well-being, I mean, there's also that transition. And it's not just for Aboriginal people, but any faith and any culture. Mm. I, I've got to say, I think that's fantastic. I don't know whether that exists in hospitals around Australia, but I do remember a beautiful space in um, Paris at the Paris Hospital called the Salon Depart. I think the, the Salon for when you depart. And it was a private space. If someone had lost a, a child or anybody, really, they could go and had a beautifully designed room. Um, and, a, and actually a score that had been created specifically for it where you could ha go there and repose, essentially, and, and to think. So I, I don't know if that exists in the new ex sexy hospital here in Adelaide, uh, the most expensive no, well, hospital in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I actually couldn't tell you. I think it, it probably would because I know the space that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me that there would be spaces like that, or a space at least, um, and completely non-denominational. Um, that would be in, integral in, in that, but uh, 
I'm only guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, the King's Fund in the UK did a, a fantastic bit of research um, on enhancing end-of-life care, which looked at um, mortuary design and those, you know, waiting rooms, etc. But was specifically around that, and mm. it's it's really great. Yeah, Sarah Waller. Because I know we're talking a lot about the arts and health, but there's also, you know, that transition of spirituality, and I think. The arts is very integral in that as well, mm. and especially in these health infrastructures where there's music, you know, the visual, um, all sorts of other aspects of art that can be incorporated. But thank you. Thank you for your response. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question, Tracy? Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> what, is the, what does the yeah. pilot say? Are we landing soon? It's fine, yeah. You sure? Yeah, all right. Okay. Fine. On our descent. Yeah, that's right. Who's got yeah. one more question? Thank you. Oh, that was handy. That was convenient. Yeah, no we don't want you to work too hard. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm a mental health clinician and an artist as well. And I think one of the things I'd love to talk about and hear your ideas is we've talked a lot about research, but what about capturing what the patient and the client wants and giving that a voice? Because I think when we do that, then we have power to say to our psychiatrists and head clinicians, this is working and this is what they want. So I'm curious to hear your methods and your thoughts and on how do we capture the patient's voice and embed that in our projects and our proposals and all that sort of stuff. Christine? Well, <laughs> um, in the work that I do, most evaluations um, focus very strongly on asking people how was it in, mm. in a range of you know, much more sophisticated ways than that. Um, but basically, that's, that's the most valuable, the most meaningful kind of data that you can collect from a lot of these sorts of experiences. Um, to the extent that you can generalise and get more sort of broad statistical, perhaps generalisable statistics, there are certain, you know, if you create a, a measure and in some areas it's easier to do than others when a, you're working with an individual to produce a particular outcome. But if you're talking about a more generalised process, the best thing you can do is ask people and ask as many people representing a range of different um, sorts of experiences and perspectives. And it happens, that's really the core of the sort of evaluation work that happens mostly around arts and health. Mm. Mm. This is such a big conversation, it's fascinating. And each of you are wonderful and I really appreciate your time here on the stage. I, I, I was wondering if I could just wrap up with one, like if you could have, wave, I love this question, if you could wave a magic wand mm. to fix all the problems in the universe, but specifically art and health and what we're talking about today, what would be the one thing? And, I, and you can't answer everything, but is there one thing that you would do right now? Jane? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on, okay. All oh, right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm gonna. It's random, random, random. Paula. Oh. <laughs> Go on. Oh. I, I. I suppose. Oh, it's not one word. It's um. It's about coming back to the voice of the service user and capturing their experience, then taking that to the people that hold the purse strings. That would be what okay. I would do. Okay. Sally. I'll go. Well, oh. getting actually getting John. <laughs> I think John Coveney um, up into some position of um, you know great influence to wave a magic okay. wand. Dean so of, getting Dean those decision world. makers, Dean of, Dean of the world. So you're talking about having great great leadership, great advocacy. That's yeah, what you want. Yeah. I'm going to make you go last, Jade. Just to tease Jade. <laughs> it's a little bit like you know. Yes, you have to invest and you have to believe in that investment. And if you think of something like this South Australian Art Gallery and how you know that's one of the most uh, populated and busiest buildings in Adelaide. More people go to the art gallery than they do to the football, believe it or not. Um, and I so, love that stat. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if the investment is there in a public sense for the value of art, then it needs to then be translated into other sectors where it can be engaged in. Mm. So I, I guess it's actually getting that investment there in the first place. Yep. Bam. I agree with you. Christine? Keep talking to each other and keep talking to anyone who'll listen. Okay. <laughs> and this be is a, a champion. Be a champion <laughs> for it. Okay. Um, one question, yes, sorry. Where would you find a forum for increased uh, advocacy on this issue? A I forum? Think that'll be a way forward. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Is that a, that, is that a question or an. 
A suggestion. A suggestion. Yeah, okay. good one. Fine, find a great good. forum. Well, Perfect. Okay, let's talking about connections and talking. Let's continue talking. I'm going. I'm not going to do the final wrap up here because I've got to pass it back to Tracy. He's got to make sure you're all safe. Um, but it is lunchtime soon, so I think we can continue the chat there. But on that note, would you please thank, with a huge, massive round of applause, Sally Francis, Christine Cutland, Jane Lawrence, and Paula Gillespie for bringing. <laughs>